My favorite movie is called Ravenous, a 1999 cannibal western folk horror comedy directed by Antonia Byrd. It tells the story of Captain John Boyd, a soldier in the Mexican-American War who's banished to a windswept fort in the Sierra Nevadas as a punishment for battlefield cowardice. One night, a starved and bedraggled stranger named F.W. Calhoun comes stumbling down from the mountains, telling a horrific tale of stranded pioneers forced to resort to cannibalism. Boyd's company mounts an expedition to rescue the survivors, but soon finds that there's much more to Calhoun than meets the eye. Three years ago, I made a video called Why Ravenous is the Greatest Movie Ever Made, a conviction that has only deepened over time, in which I gushed and fawned over many of the reasons I love this film, such as the performances, the cinematography, the editing, and especially Antonia Byrd's exceptional directing. But that was a relatively short video, only about 20 minutes, and I think there's quite a bit I left on the table. So now I'd like to fully indulge the turtleneck-wearing, NPR-listening English major who lives in my head with a bloated, long-winded, high-handed, egg-headed, grandiose, snooty, ostentatious, needlessly oriented video essay in which I use words like dialectic and quote from books with titles like The Sexual Politics of Meat. And yes, I will be criticizing capitalism. <laughs> Ravenous is a deeply, unapologetically, fundamentally anti-American film. The opening sequence begins with the star-spangled banner fluttering proudly in the breeze, and ends with a man vomiting all over his shoes. It's about as subtle as a sledgehammer, but you know what, not everything needs to be seen from a marriage. In this scene, Lieutenant John Boyd is promoted to captain as a reward for capturing some enemy officers, and honored with a big steak dinner. The only thing is, this entire ceremony is predicated upon a lie. For heroism above and beyond the call of duty, for successfully infiltrating the enemy's ranks, and securing victory independently with cunning and honor. Boyd's no hero. He captured the enemy command almost by accident. After freezing up and playing dead on the battlefield, he was buried in a mass grave that just happened to be near where some Mexican officers were headquartered. And Boyd's heroism in the line of duty isn't the only lie here. The pageantry, the pomp, all the fluttering gallantry of the promotion ceremony belies the American military's true objective in the Mexican-American War, an imperialist and racist war of aggression. Imperialist in that the war was launched on a thin pretext, and peddled by upper-class slavers bent on expanding the plantation economy. Racist in that after Jacksonian democracy emphasized the centrality of white supremacy to American individualism, the nationalist mythology of manifest destiny became predicated on the expulsion, subjugation, or eradication of non-white political power in the American empire. We hear an amen as the soldiers sit down to dinner, the juxtaposition of Christian piety and American heraldry hitting differently in the 2020s, the imagery fitting neatly somewhere between Carlson and Riefenstahl. A different time, but the same old American authoritarianism, as always, wrapped in the flag and carrying the cross. Boyd's steak is as bloody as the battlefield. He's sweating, disgusted with the meat on his plate, the whole ceremony, and himself. The other men at the table flash him with judgy, bitchy glances. Why isn't he eating? Why does he look like he's about to hurl? Be a soldier, be a man, be one of the boys. Don't you want to fit in? Eat up. Surrounded by more flags than a 4th of July parade, the white men in charge of this belligerent slave republic shovel corpse parts down their gullets with voracious enthusiasm. Boyd alone can see this feeding for the grotesquerie that it is. But he's got to keep it together. Unraveling in public isn't very soldierly. Feeling queasy isn't very manly, especially when eating the manliest thing of all, flesh. He tries his best to take a bite, but it's all too much. He rushes off to spew, the title card comes crashing into frame with the first dulcimer plucks of Boyd's journey, and soon we're up and away, over the mountains, to Fort Spencer. In 90 seconds of runtime, Antonia Byrd rips to pieces 200 years of self-congratulatory American mythology. And it's very intentional. I may be overanalyzing, but I'm not tripping. As one of Byrd's collaborators, the actor Kate Hardy, put it in a 2016 interview, When you call someone a political filmmaker, it is possible to think you are referring only to the subjects they put on screen. Antonia was a political filmmaker. She was also, regardless of her politics, quite simply a highly skilled and creative director. But she knew film was a deeply effective communication tool, and without doubt she used it to voice her political beliefs and frustrations. The world of film and TV is a pretty conservative place. Although often perceived as highly liberal, in reality, it is rife with hierarchy, emotional repression, and abuses of power. Antonia put herself on the line again and again. She taught me a huge amount about acting and working with the camera. 
but she also taught me a huge amount about the morality of collaboration. These are not necessarily lessons that make for an easy career. Her convictions and concerns were pretty non-negotiable. Her political beliefs were her map, and at times that made things difficult for her. But, in an industry full of dubious morals and flaky convictions, I found her truly inspiring. And, it shouldn't really need pointing out these days, but sadly it still does. In an industry whose statistics regarding gender equality are worse than both banking and the army, the amount she managed to achieve as a female director is something of a miracle. Bird's radical politics played a huge role in all of her films, and Ravenous is a vicious attack on American institutions of power, governmental, economic, cultural, racial, and patriarchal. Arriving at Fort Spencer, it soon becomes clear to Boyd that this is where the army dumps its undesirables. It's the island of broken toys, a motley crew of oddballs and outcasts. Each of the denizens of Fort Spencer are, in their own way, incompatible with the conservative, bellicose, white supremacist, and patriarchal social order of mid-19th century America. Their uniqueness and individuality subverts the American national myth, so the institutions of power tuck them away, out of sight, high up in the mountains. Colonel Hart, the commanding officer, is an overeducated dork. Bookish, gullible, and sensitive, he's a far cry from the Jacksonian ideal of American martial masculinity. And though he takes his responsibilities as a leader seriously, in reality he's a symbolic figurehead at best. He regards his post at Fort Spencer as more of a prison sentence than anything, remarking in a deleted scene that one just ends up in Fort Spencer. I'm here for life. Private Toffler is either neurodivergent or just profoundly weird. Probably both. A gentle, upbeat puppy dog of a man, the greatest source of meaning in his life comes from his faith, to the point of fixation, and he spends much of his free time writing terrible hymns. Major Knox is a pompous, upper-class southerner. His genteel moonlight and magnolia's manner a thin mask over his addictive personality and penchant for dishonesty. The circumstances of his fall from grace no doubt stem from his severe alcoholism, and one can easily imagine him getting sloppy drunk at a white glove tea party over at the Davises. Major Knox was most improper at the lunch in Jefferson. I won't have him in my house again. Private Reich is the only competent soldier of the bunch. If anything, he's too dedicated to army life. We learn in a deleted scene that he was once a major, but got demoted and banished to Fort Spencer after shooting a man under his command, a friend no less for daring to suggest that Reich order a retreat. They court-martial me for killing somebody. Well, it's what you're paid to do, isn't it? Yeah, on well, that one, it's one of your own truth. The military taught Reich to renounce his individuality, temper his empathy, and become a thoughtlessly efficient killing machine. To never surrender, never retreat, win no matter what. And then, when he takes that violent mindset to its logical conclusion, he's punished for it. Though at first glance Reich seems to embody the American masculine ideal, he's actually the biggest victim of it in the whole company. Martha, the sole woman at Fort Spencer, and George, her brother, are the only locals in the group. Martha is sober, soft-spoken, and practical. One gets the sense that she's the only grown-up in the garrison. Hart's name may be on all the paperwork, but Martha is effectively the matriarch of Fort Spencer. George is, bless him, kind of a fuck-up. He spends most of his time smoking weed with Private Cleves, the cook, a hippie with an artistic bent with the odd hobby of building abstract sculptures out of found objects. One gets the sense that he never wears his uniform unless he absolutely has to. This really quite sweet friendship between an indigenous layabout and an insubordinate colonizing soldier who clearly couldn't care less about cause and country is, in a way, the ultimate insult to the philosophy of Manifest Destiny. Built initially by the Spanish as a mission, then repurposed by the Americans as a way station for pioneers bound for California, Fort Spencer's purpose has always been to facilitate the spiritual and territorial conquest of this region. First by the warlike evangelism of Cortez and Pizarro, next by the rapacious expansionism of Jackson and Polk. Our misfit heroes are warm bodies, meant to plant a flag and occupy this Lebensraum until the teeming masses of American Volk can arrive and begin the real work of sucking gold out of these hills by the ton, chewing this land down to the bone with the mindless, twitching mastication of cockroaches burrowing into a corpse. Ravenous skewers many aspects of American mythology, but on its face, this is a movie about colonialism. You don't have to be a turtleneck-wearing, NPR-listening English major to see how the film's rendition of the Wendigo parallels the American Empire's insatiable appetite for westward expansion. In the world of the film, cannibals inherit spiritual and physical strength from the people they eat. In colonialism, imperialist governments gain political and economic power from consuming other countries and peoples. Wendigo eats. 
must eat more, more. He never enough. He, he takes. Never, never gives. But Ravenous's central allegory of cannibalism as colonialism is far deeper and has much more historical precedent than may initially be evident. Ravenous has oft been compared to the masterful first season of the AMC show The Terror, and for good reason. The similarities are striking. Like Ravenous, The Terror is a horror story about colonialism in the 1840s, with subtle supernatural elements and a slight, handsome, long-haired gay cannibal villain who gets fetishized on Tumblr. Calhoun's Donner Party-esque story in Ravenous and the doomed Franklin expedition in The Terror ring true not just to the historical events that inspired each of them, but to a broader pattern in the colonization of the Americas as a whole. There are countless stories of European expeditions to remote or unexplored regions, where the greatest threat to European safety was thought to be the quote-unquote savage indigenous people, with a common racial stereotype associating them with cannibalism. But then, as the expedition falters due to hubris, incompetence, or the hostile forces of nature, the pageantry of empire falls away, and the colonizers are themselves reduced to a savage, animalistic state. Their economic goals are quickly forgotten, and the adventure devolves into a brute struggle for survival. It's at desperate times like these that the knives come out. Special of the day? Long pork. Limited time only, while supplies last. Take away the fluttering flags, the soaring anthems, the dazzling uniforms, and the proud ships, and what's left of colonialism? Predatory, carnivorous consumption. In the terror, Toonbach, the demonic polar bear, takes on the attributes of the people he eats. This actually helps bring about his downfall. Just as the sailors of the Franklin expedition grow weak and sickly from scurvy and lead poisoning from their canned food, Toonbach grows weak and sickly from consuming their tainted flesh and absorbing their tainted souls. In Ravenous, the supernatural powers a Wendigo gains from cannibalism don't seem to have a downside. Ives, Hart, and Boyd don't get drunk from eating Major Knox, for instance. But the basic principle remains the same. A man eats the flesh of another. He steals his strength. He absorbs the other man's spirit. Remarkably, 19th century social Darwinists had beliefs about the inherent power of meat that are near identical to Ives's, and some American white supremacists credited the carnivorous Anglo-Saxon diet as playing a key role in their conquest of so many inferior vegetarian races. In one popular medical text of the time, neurologist George Miller Beard explained the foolproof reasoning behind this claim. The rice-eating Hindu and Chinese and the potato-eating Irish peasant are kept in subjection by the well-fed English. Of the various causes that contributed to the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo, one of the chief was that for the first time he was brought face to face with the nation of beef eaters, who stood still until they were killed. The peasantry of France, Italy, and Spain, who take their half bottle of wine with rice and soup, must always give way, in battle or labor, to the properly fed Englishman or American. Though Dr. Beard's hypothesis is racist nonsense, there is some tangential truth in what he's saying here. The history of colonialism in America is inextricably bound up in the history of meat consumption, and the animal-based economy of Anglo-American colonists played a huge and underappreciated role in the demand for westward expansion. At the forefront of every American frontier in early colonial history were the itinerant fur trappers, disrupting indigenous economies with high-end European demand. Right behind them were the animal farmers fencing off farm lots and establishing permanent towns, which solidified European sovereignty. Pigs, cows, and chickens are a European export to this hemisphere, and the raising of economically viable numbers of livestock requires an enormous amount of land. From the cowpens of Plymouth Colony to the state-sized mega-ranches of Texas, colonizers almost always needed more living space for the animals they ate than they did for themselves. Of course, the indigenous people of North America ate plenty of animals too, but it's not too much of a generalization to say that there was a fundamental difference in how Native Americans and Europeans of the period conceptualized meat as a resource. Many indigenous religions imbued animals with enormous spiritual significance. Hunting and trapping practices were often laden with ceremonial requirements as a result, reflecting a cultural belief in the inherent sanctity of life regardless of species. 
In contrast, European animal farming was characterized by fixed boundaries and strict hierarchies. Farmland was carefully divided into field lots and physically enclosed behind fences and stone walls. The animal farm was a microcosm of feudalism, with the farmer as lord of the manor, his wife and children stewards and footmen, his cattle lowly villains. When a Wampanoag hunter shot a wolf, he thanked the wolf for feeding his family. When a Massachusetts Bay farmer sat down for pork, he thanked God for giving him dominion over pigs. In the 19th century, social Darwinism maintained that meat-eating wasn't just crucial to the economy of the American master race, it was the reason they were the masters in the first place. As Beard explained, Savages are themselves but little removed from the common animal stock from which they are derived. They are much nearer to those forms of life. Savages who feed on poor food are poor savages, and intellectually far inferior to the beef-eaters of any race. And the only non-whites carnivorous enough to challenge the dietary supremacy of Anglo-Saxons, Beard believed, were cannibal tribes. Man is good food for man, and cannibals are the strongest and healthiest of savages. The Fanus, a tribe of Africa who eat the bodies of those who have died of sickness, and who steal and eat bodies that have been long dead, are said to be the finest set of Negroes in the interior of Africa. Cannibals eat human beings, not because they hate them, but because they love their flesh. They eat them for the same reason that we eat the lower animals, and do not therefore feel any more unkindly toward them than we feel toward our cows whose tender steaks we so much enjoy. Meat was the white man's food, and flesh was the currency of colonialism, often in a literal sense, but more importantly in an identitarian one. Like Colonel Ives, the white race was dominant because they were predators, supernaturally strong from gorging on the life force of others. A tiger doesn't consider the feelings of his prey before he eats them, so why on earth would the white race hamper its own ascendance by concerning itself with the morality of subjugating those that are so self-evidently inferior? The philosophy of white supremacy threw up scientific barriers between the races, very much akin to designations between species. In the Victorian mind, race was not an arbitrary social construct, but an immutable biological classification, which justified systematic exploitation and conditioned otherwise good-natured whites to accept racial hierarchy as a fact of nature. Though white Americans did not literally eat people of color during slavery and colonialism, they may as well have. Colonel Ives fits perfectly within the social Darwinist paradigm. He isn't a dark reflection of the American colonialist psyche. He is that psyche, in the flesh. Stark, unexaggerated, honest. Ravenous doesn't portray 19th century America as particularly complex, morally speaking. America isn't an imperfect experiment, a work in progress, a basically good system with some unfortunate kinks that need to be ironed out. Instead, the film pulls up the floorboards of our history and encourages us to get a good long whiff of the foundational rot. After Boyd returns to Fort Spencer, the apparent sole survivor of Calhoun's massacre in the mountains, General Slauson encourages him to amend his outlandish account of events. What comes across as healthy skepticism, even fatherly concern, on Slauson's part is revealed for what it truly is in a deleted scene. You may not know gold was struck just outside San Francisco a few months ago, and word spread very fast to the rest of the country. The reports are we should experience ten times the usual number of settlers this summer. The Commonwealth is going to explode. California may even be granted a statehood. Hmm? Now, word gets out about this, that there's this monster lurking up in the mountains who's got an appetite for human flesh. Well, we can just wave farewell to the rush of 48. Nothing can stop this gravy train, ever. There might be a shark in these waters, there might not. Who's to say? The beach stays open. End of story. General Slauson is named after a major boulevard in Los Angeles, Slauson Avenue. If Ives is the personification of Manifest Destiny, Slauson is the embodiment of Hollywood, of Silicon Valley, of the profit and status-obsessed industries of West Coast capitalism. Antonia Bird had good reason to lampoon Hollywood. Her only other American movie, the 1995 picture Mad Love starring Drew Barrymore, was shredded to pieces in editing by the skittish studio, turning what had been a raw drama about a young woman suffering from bipolar disorder into a by-the-numbers teen romance road trip movie. Bird made movies because she had a story to tell, not because it would make her or a studio money. Avowedly anti-capitalist, she had a people-over-profits philosophy in both her politics and her work, bringing an egalitarian and supportive style of leadership to her sets. 
as Kate Hardy recollected. Antonia was a deeply socialist filmmaker, both on and importantly off camera. She had a constant eye out for the abuse of power and huge respect for the workers that helped her tell stories the way she wanted to tell them. She saw actors as technicians, as co-workers who deserved her protection and care. To be on an Antonia set was to know she had your back totally and, often to her own detriment, was not pandering to producers or those with the money. Her focus was on supporting you. I often joke that working with Antonia as early as I did in my career ruined it for me. It's a silly joke, but it has its roots in fact. I first worked with her in 1984, and I've rarely had such an experience since. Bird was not the first socialist artist to make the link between flesh-eating and capitalism. In his seminal novel, The Jungle, Upton Sinclair repeatedly compared the exploitative conditions of factory workers in the meat industry with the nightmarish existences of the animals whose flesh they were harvesting. What they wanted from a hog was all the profits that could be got out of him, and that was what they wanted from the working man. And also, that was what they wanted from the public. What the hog thought of it and what he suffered were not considered, and no more was it with labor and no more with the purchaser of meat. A particularly apt analogy, considering that the assembly line, that most dehumanizing of capitalist inventions, owes its popularization to a visit Henry Ford made to the very Chicago slaughterhouses that Sinclair describes in his novel. Struck with inspiration, Ford incorporated the model into his factories, where it proved so profitable and efficient, it soon caught on in other industries. The assembly line had a profound effect on the American worker. Gone were the days when a skilled craftsman took pride in the creation of a singular product. Now labor was fragmented, with each worker performing a rote, repetitive task that formed but one chain in the process. The pursuit of profit to the exclusion of anything else stripped workers of their artistry, annihilated their sense of workplace accomplishment, and transformed them into inert, unthinking machines. The capitalist economy is a meat grinder of labor, and it devours workers' most precious commodities, their health, their dignity, and their limited time. On the other side of the meat grinders are the consumers, baby birds with mouths open wide, quivering in carnal excitement for their sacrament of blood. In Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho, Patrick Bateman describes murdering and eating women in some of the most graphic passages in all of American literature. Flip the page, and he's going on an equally indulgent screed about all the features of his new cassette player. There is no meat without death, and there is no consumerism without exploitation. Ravenous is a movie fixated on the idea of consumption, especially in pursuit of fleeting pleasure or short-term gain. In a way, as individuals living under capitalism, we are all Wendigos, chasing the high of acquisition and consumption, always on the lookout for shiny new toys to play with, until we inevitably scuff them up or get sick of them, whereupon we begin to hunger for consumption once again. Like Romero's horde of zombies shambling through a shopping mall on the prowl for fresh meat and low prices, capitalist industries and marketing intentionally condition us to pursue short-term gratification, which is inherently addictive. In the 20th century, capitalism wanted the contents of our wallets. In the 21st, it realized the astounding earning potential of the contents of our minds, and tech companies like Facebook and Google intentionally gamify their social media platforms to keep users and creators alike continually engaged to maximize profit and increase shareholder value. YouTube Creator Studio, for instance, is structured to make the production and publication of content functionally indistinguishable from a gambling addiction. By heaping excessive praise onto creators when they produce a profitable video, and expressing sullen disappointment when they produce an unprofitable one, as well as providing helpful information on how you can draw in more of an audience next time, Google intentionally fosters an unhealthy psychological dependence on the stimuli of exhibition and attention. Remember this? Remember the energy? as it dissipates. Strength slipping from your grasp. Growing, killing need to replenish. Their goal is, of course, monetary. Encouraging creators to post as much as possible, as marketably as possible, keeps you, the user, online for longer, so tech companies can collect more information about you to sell to advertisers. As the venerable Bo Burnham once put it, it's because these companies like Twitter and uh, YouTube and Instagram and everything, they went public and they went to shareholders. So they have to grow. Their entire models are based off of growth. They cannot stay stagnant. YouTube, uh, Twitter 
grossed four or five billion dollars last year. It is in the red. It is unprofitable. It has to get more of you. That could be the ceiling for a place like this. YouTube, the ceiling could be three hours of engagement. No matter how nice it's trying to be, it is all that they're trying to get more engagement from you. We, the, we used to colonize land. That was the thing you could expand into. And that's where money was to be made. We colonized the entire earth. There was no other place for the businesses and capitalism to expand into. And then they realized human attention that we can now, they are now trying to colonize every minute of your life. That is what these people are trying to do. Every single free moment you have is a moment you could be looking at your phone and they could be gathering information to target ads at you. That that's what's happening. But if we are all Wendigos, then at least we come by it honestly. It's not Lucy Westerner's fault that she's a bloodsucker. Count Dracula made her that way. She didn't have a say in the matter. It's often said there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, which is a lie. There are unquestionably ways that we as consumers can make more ethical choices. And even if it's just a drop in the bucket, at least we can go to sleep at night knowing that we're doing what we can to limit our participation in this vampiric economic system. But the point nonetheless stands, that our thirst for blood is peanuts compared to the counts and countesses of the corporate elite. The Wendigo, as a metaphor for the rich, certainly has a fair bit of protein. And I don't mean nice suburb rich. I don't even mean famous actor rich. I mean, fuck you, fuck you. I don't even care about climate change. I'm in New Zealand with my own private army rich. Not like some pathetic asshole beach house on the vineyard rich. Colonel Ives tells Boyd that the power of the Wendigo saved his life. He suffered from tuberculosis, migraines, depression, and suicidal ideation. But switching to a long pork diet cured him completely of all those ailments, and left him happy and healthy and virile. In the world of Ravenous, the cannibal diet has certain curative powers. If Ives had killed just a few people, and eaten just enough human flesh to cure the diseases that were going to kill him, then we might rightly still judge him a monster, but at least we'd understand why he did what he did. But he doesn't stop. He keeps going. Keeps killing. Keeps eating. When Deagle eats, he must eat more, more. He never enough. He, he takes. Never, never gives. There's only so much money a person can spend within a single human lifetime. Every billionaire on the planet has exceeded that number a hundredfold. And yet, they still put all their energies into the acquisition of yet more money. At that point, it's no longer about being rich. It's no longer even about being powerful. It's about being the richest and the most powerful. Everything's relative in the pursuit of status. When my YouTube channel, Atun Shea Films, which is the YouTube channel you are currently watching, was very, very small, I was really jealous of the people who had 100,000 subscribers. Ooh, those people with the silver play button, I thought. They've got it made. When I reached 100,000 subscribers myself, I was content for a while. I thought that was a very respectable number. And then the enthusiasm began to dissipate. And there it was again. Growing, killing me to replenish. A couple years go by, 200, 300,000 subscribers, a bigger audience than I could have ever dreamed of when I started making acerbic reviews of mummy movies on my days off. I start getting used to being the most interesting man in the room. Did you know that Andy over there has a big YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Oh, uh, it's called Atun Shea Films. I don't know how to spell it either. Just search Checkmate Lincoln Heights and it'll come up. And soon enough though, I'm getting dinner with like properly famous creators, people with like salaried employees and shit. And then suddenly I feel two inches tall again. It never ends. Whether it's Sackler getting us all hooked on dope or Zuckerberg trying to bring prime intellect online or Musk doing whatever the fuck he's doing, all the power plays, all the acquisition, all the obscene piles of untouched money, any one of which could solve homelessness overnight, it's all to sate that. Growing, killing me to replenish. The lives of countless millions have been consumed to feed the egos of these sallow little rich men, and their industries are devouring people and profits at a faster rate than ever. Like Ives, they would rather die than stop eating, and the only thing that seems to be trickling down is blood. The global temperature is rising, each hurricane season is worse than the last, but hey, the beach is still open, the gravy train's still moving, the meat grinder is still ripping through a biblical quantity of sinew and bone. When the Atlantic surges through Manhattan, the boys at the stock exchange will still be buying and selling right up until the moment their heads disappear beneath the water. Planet Earth sacrificed atop the Stygian altar of capitalism just so a gaggle of spoiled brats can get just one more fucking 
pit. Eat to live. Don't live to eat. In a 1999 interview with the New York Post, Antonia Bird remarked, I was a vegetarian once. After I made this movie, I went off meat again, for obvious reasons. I used to regard Bird's vegetarianism as a cute little tidbit. How funny, the vegetarian made a cannibal movie. But the more I watch it, the more I'm convinced that Ravenous is right up there with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Babe in the holy trinity of radical vegan cinema. Now, real quick, I do want to be specific with my terms here. So when I refer to veganism, I'm talking about the dictionary definition, which is... Veganism. Noun. A way of living which seeks to exclude, as far as is possible and practical, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to non-human animals. So I'm talking about veganism the philosophy, not veganism the diet. And it's also important to distinguish it from vegetarianism in that regard. Vegetarians abstain from meat, but they may also eat dairy or eggs, or wear leather or fur, or use products that have been tested on animals. Ethical vegans believe in achieving animal liberation. Basically, a world where humanity has evolved beyond utilizing animals as resources. You're not an eater of ribs, Carlisle? No, no, Major, I am. I can never forget it used to be an animal. This is a fun, ironic little exchange, but technically, you could be vegan and still eat people. In fact, since most people perpetuate animal suffering in one way or another, maybe the only way to be a good vegan is to eat people. One more definition to throw at you here. The philosophical antithesis of veganism is carnism, a word coined by psychologist Melanie Joy in 2001. Carnism, noun the invisible or unrecognized belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. If someone hurt my dog, I would go absolutely postal. When I got through with that person, there'd be nothing left of them but a red spot. So why do I eat pig for breakfast, chicken for lunch, and cow for dinner? What's the relevant moral difference between killing a dog and killing a pig? Why do we as a culture get all bent out of shape whenever some rich asshole goes over to Botswana and guns down an elephant? While at the same time, every single day, we turn a blind eye to pigs killed by the billions in CO2 gas chambers, deemed the most humane method of slaughter. Industrial fishing trawlers dragging enormous nets across the ocean floor, indiscriminately dragging up all fish caught in their wake, including endangered species, wreaking so much havoc on aquatic ecosystems that at the current rate, the world will run out of wild-caught seafood in less than 30 years. Dairy cows forcibly impregnated on a device farmers nickname the rape rack. Their genetically modified, oversized udders drained with painful industrial milking vacuums, only for the whole process to immediately start again, over and over, until those cows can no longer reproduce and are subsequently killed for their meat. Egg-laying hens imprisoned in dark, cramped cages by the billions, each bird living her entire miserable life in a tiny space no larger than a sheet of letter paper genetically engineered to lay 30 times more eggs than they would in the wild. Then, once spent, usually after about a year, ground up for byproducts. Well, as Dr. Joy has it, it's because of carnism. According to her, Carnism runs counter to core human values, such as compassion and justice. Most people wouldn't willingly violate these values and support unnecessary violence toward other sentient beings. Therefore, carnism, like other oppressive systems, such as patriarchy and racism, uses a set of psychological defense mechanisms that distort our thoughts and block our natural empathy so that we act against our values without fully realizing what we're doing. In other words, carnism conditions us not to think and feel. Carnistic defenses hide the contradictions between our values and behaviors so that we unknowingly make exceptions to what we would normally consider unethical. In the 1995 film Babe, our adorable hero narrowly avoids the grisly death that his mother and siblings face at a slaughterhouse. There was a time not so long ago when pigs were afforded no respect except by other pigs. They lived their whole lives in a cruel and sunless world. And though he's removed from imminent danger, he still faces prejudice at his new home at the Hoggett Farm, which serves as a microcosm of the carnist world in which we live. Dogs and cats assume their implicit superiority over the other animals. Sheep are, quote, morons to be dominated, and a pig's only purpose is to be eaten by humans. They eat pigs? Pork, they call it. Or bacon. They only call them pigs when they're alive. Under carnism, the value of an animal's life is measured by his or her function to human interests. 
Case in point, Ferdinand the Duck frantically schemes up ways to avoid the butcher's block, eventually learning how to crow like a rooster so he'll have some utility to humans beyond food. I suppose the life of an anorexic duck doesn't amount to much in the broad scheme of things. And the sheepdog fly perfectly illustrates the carnist mindset when she prevents Babe from coming into the family house. Babe, huh? you wait here. Aren't pigs alone? Not live one. <laughs> Sorry, dear. Only dogs and cats inside the house. Why? That's just the way things are. There is no relevant moral distinction between Babe and Fly, only the crude bigotry of cultural tradition. It's just the way things are, a phrase used to justify every species <laughs> of oppression since time immemorial. The only way you'll find happiness is to accept that the way things are is the way things are. The way things are stinks. And this strikes at the very heart of carnism. It's made up. It doesn't exist. It's a social construct like gender or race. The only reason we love dogs, eat pigs, and wear cows is because we were told to. Every child has a horrible moment when he or she realizes that the flesh on their plate came from an intelligent and emotionally sophisticated individual, just like Mr. Mittens. And their parents have to explain, no, sweetie, Mr. Mittens is family. These other ones, they don't matter. Yeah, we kill them by the billions without mercy, but it's fine. Just don't think about it too much. Babe, therefore, is a triumphant tale of victory over carnism. When Farmer Hoggett brings Babe out onto the pitch of the sheep herding competition, the entire crowd of onlookers laughs and jeers. Blinded by arrogance and prejudice, they can't conceive of a lowly pig as an individual worthy of respect. When Babe uses a trick he learned from befriending the sheep at the Hoggett farm to flawlessly execute the trial, testifying to the power of Babe's tolerance, his Paddington-esque superpower to see the best in everyone, carnism is effortlessly defeated, blown over like the paper tiger it is and the crowd can't help but be won over. And though every single human in the stands or in the commentary boxes was at a complete loss for words, the man who in his life had uttered fewer words than any of them knew exactly what to say. That little pig. That'll do. <laughs> that's Kino right there. That's that's oh, that's cinema. One of the best endings to any movie ever. Almost as good as Toby Hooper, director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, famously remarked that the horror classic was a film about meat. Early in the runtime, Franklin, one of our doomed teenagers, regales his friends with lurid tales of a nearby slaughterhouse where his family was once employed. Now they got this big air gun that shoots a bolt into their skull and then retracts it. It's just boom! Later, when the teens are themselves slaughtered, it's by the methods of the factory farm. By turning the tools of the slaughterhouse against human victims, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre weaves the carnist's worst nightmare, the animal's symbolic revenge, the human race finally getting a taste of its own unspeakable medicine. When Leatherface kills Kirk, his first victim, he drops like a rock and twitches, exactly like a pig or cow does on the killing floor. Consider the iconic, climactic dinner scene, where Sally is presented to Grandpa to be stunned for slaughter. Grandpa's the best, it won't hurt a bit. Sally writhing in fear, the frail Grandpa trying and failing to bring the hammer swinging down, is a remarkably accurate representation of a slaughterhouse worker trying to stun a cow. This supposedly humane measure is in reality a messy and painful process. Cows are frequently improperly stunned, and are subsequently bled out and dismembered alive.
Boom! Bagman, I like me. Please take the subject. But Leatherface and his family of cannibals are victims of carnism too. Through no fault of their own, rural poverty forced them to take grueling jobs on the killing floor of a slaughterhouse, where hour after hour, day after day of senseless suffering and mass death left them psychologically broken, unable to empathize. Like the military and ravenous, the meat industry has stripped them of their humanity and turned them into drones, mindless enforcers of a monstrous and arbitrary system of oppression. Every serial killer worth their salt got his start mutilating the neighbor's cat. And a chronic lack of empathy toward non-human animals will inevitably lead to a chronic lack of empathy toward human animals. Often, the inverse is also true. When Cracker Barrel added impossible sausages to their menu in the summer of 2022, there was a major outcry among right-wing Americans who perceived the rural chain as being theirs for some reason. This sort of controversy should not come as a surprise. Since the far right's defining characteristic is the othering and attempted domination of groups they perceive as inferior, the mere suggestion that non-human animals should be viewed as anything other than a resource existing purely to serve humanity is unthinkable, totally beyond the pale. In a carnist culture, basic empathy is viewed as weak, effeminate, impolitic, or misguided. The opening scene of Ravenous has Boyd struggling to keep it together and maintain social niceties, as the rotting cow flesh on his plate makes his stomach royal and his gorge rise. It's the horror of being the only vegan at Thanksgiving, encompassed beautifully by Anthony Richmond's cinematography and Neil Farrell's editing. But Ravenous's most biting <laughs> animal rights commentary comes in the form of its satire. In my opinion, some of the best progressive satire out there right now is coming out of vegan spaces, such as Elwood's Dog Meat, a website which mimics the folksy marketing of the animal agriculture industry to advertise dogs and sausage, retriever steak, and pug bacon. <laughs> Naturally, most people who don't get the joke are outraged, and Elwoods gets angry, even threatening emails every day from dog lovers who think this is a real business, to which Elwoods always has a quippy reply ready about how awful it is that these preachy militant vegans are attacking their poor family farm. There are all sorts of variations on this theme in modern vegan satire, including with cannibalism, but Ravenous did it first and did it best. After Colonel Hart kills Major Knox, Boyd is left alone in Fort Spencer with the two cannibals, and a fascinating dynamic between the three men immediately takes shape. Intentional or not, it's a pitch-perfect satire of carnism, with each character representing the three most common attitudes toward the human oppression of animals. One of the first things Hart tells Boyd after decapitating Knox is, I hated doing that. <sighs> Hart is a cannibal, but at least he has the decency to feel bad about it. He's the reluctant carnist, the empathic meat-eater. He may recognize the evil of animal exploitation in the abstract, but won't dig into the moral arguments too deeply, as he's ultimately afraid of what he'll find. The truth about meat is behind a door he'd rather keep firmly locked. He knows that if he were to be fully confronted by that truth, he would be forced to make a choice, either to continue perpetuating a system of oppression, now without the reasonable excuse of not knowing any better, or to radically change his outlook on life. So for the time being, Hart postpones that choice with cognitive dissonance, Consuming flesh makes him feel terrific, and he will offer up any flimsy justification he can to maintain that pleasure. I'm still having nightmares. Oh, no. No. Reich. No. Cleves. No. Knox. No! I don't want to hear this! There's no turning back now! I know that, sir. Don't you understand? All you have to do is kill! You have to kill to live! Outnumbered by cannibals two to one, Boyd is the aberration, not hard knives. As the only non-cannibal at dinner, refusing to partake until his life literally depends on it, Boyd's situation is a perfect representation of the mundane horror vegans face every day living in a carnist world. Isn't this civilized? 
Boyd's abstention is an affront to Ives' and Hart's cannibalism, and they immediately set about trying to convert him, in the same way that many carnists view veganism as a threat to be immediately quashed, a personal offense even. Because, after all, the mere existence of people who refuse to use animals as resources raises the horrifying possibility that the way we treat animals is fundamentally wrong. If the lives of animals matter, then we are all guilty of a monumental atrocity. No wonder most carnists will retreat into comfortable fictions, rather than accept that frightening and humbling reality. While Hart, the reluctant carnist, attempts to sway the vegan Boyd with an avalanche of bro-science and pseudo-logic, Ives has only one argument. It feels good, so why wouldn't you do it? That's what surprises me about you, Boyd. You've tasted it, felt its power, yet you're resisting. Why? Ives is the unrepentant carnist. While Hart deceives himself into thinking that his meat-eating is a necessary evil, Ives is more honest. He doesn't concern himself at all with these moral questions. Might makes right, the strong dominate the weak, and the most ruthless creature eats best. Ives doesn't consider cannibalism as an evil at all, but a positive good. That is, if he even thinks about it that much, which he probably doesn't. All he cares about is the power and pleasure that cannibalism gives him, and his lack of empathy leaves him completely indifferent to the suffering he causes. Like the boomer uncle who moans over steak to provoke his vegan niece, Ives' real problem isn't that he eats meat. It's that he's an asshole. As the ultimate expression of carnism in its purest form, Ives is entirely self-interested. His hunger for human flesh is an incidental extension of his hunger for dominance. Unrepentant, or at least unexamined, carnism is the dominant philosophy in our culture. Similarly, Ives rules Fort Spencer as a tyrant. He's not just content to control the individuals he regards as food, but to control his fellow cannibals as well. The capitalist meat industry, too, aggrandizes itself at the expense of hundreds of billions of brutalized animals, of traumatized and mistreated workers, and of the climate of planet Earth itself, guzzling up flesh and labor and profit into a bottomless black hole of greed. Since Ives' carnism doesn't tremble behind cognitive dissonance like Hart's does, we can see it for the baldly self-serving authoritarian ideology that it is. As a Wendigo, Ives is a purely selfish being, putting his own taste, pleasure, and personal greed over the lives and well-being of others. In the little world of Fort Spencer, he enforces through violence a fundamentally evil status quo that regards thinking, feeling individuals as nothing more than a crude resource to be ruthlessly extracted. The only difference between Fort Spencer and our culture is what's on the menu. One of the biggest reasons for Ravenous's cultural staying power is its gay subtext, and many in the queer community have wholeheartedly embraced the film as a camp love story. The central relationship between Boyd and Ives is dripping with homoerotic tension, which both Antonia Bird and Robert Carlyle have confirmed in interviews and commentaries was fully intentional. Eating meat involves taking someone else into your body. It is a communion, an inherently intimate act. Hunger and lust feel very similar. They come from the same primal areas of our psychology, and they both have the power to completely overwhelm us. 19th century Gothic literature linked penetrative sex to vampirism, with the self-evidently erotic imagery of hardened fangs plunging into quivering flesh. Now, with media like Ravenous, The Terror, and the NBC show Hannibal, 20th and 21st century horror cinema has made a similar connection between cannibalism and homosexuality. Like the scripture, Blessed are the Cheesemakers, this metaphor is not meant to be taken literally. By no means is it perversity or immorality that connects cannibalism and queerness. It's cultural non-acceptance. Because the cannibal is a monster, he has to hide his true nature from the world. Likewise, queer people are made to feel that they are monsters. Heteronormativity forces them underground, pushes them to the very fringes of society. The forbidden flesh is titillating because it is consumed in secret. And just as the Wendigo gains strength with every helping of Shao Humain, a closeted queer person is empowered every time they express their true sexuality. When Boyd was dumped alive into a mass grave in the Mexican War, he found himself in a giant pile of male bodies, with warm liquid seeping down his throat. Human blood, which infected him with the Wendigo spirit and gave him enough strength to escape and capture the enemy command. This was Boyd's first gay experience, the drunken fumble in the late-night darkness of a college dorm. 
Boyd doesn't know how to feel about this experience. At his promotion dinner, he's presented with a cut of cow flesh, a socially acceptable form of meat eating, and it disgusts him. He tries to force himself to partake, to close his eyes and think of England, but he can't do it. At Fort Spencer, Boyd falls into a deep depression. In a deleted scene, Hart tries to get Boyd to open up to him, noting that the rest of the garrison can't help but notice his sulking walks around the fort, the loss of appetite. The only thing that seems to perk Boyd up again is the arrival of Calhoun, the handsome and enigmatic stranger. When Calhoun tells the garrison the story of his lost wagon train, he includes a crucial detail of the effect cannibalism had on the party. We were soon hungry again, only this time our hunger was different. More severe. Savage. In places where homosexuality is not accepted, often the way partners find each other is through little hints that would go right over a straight person's head. Directly outing yourself is dangerous, so this is an important part of the courtship process. Boyd clearly gets the hint. As the garrison makes their way over the mountains in an attempt to rescue the survivors of the wagon train, he approaches Calhoun to drop some hints of his own. He said that when you ate the man, you said that afterwards your, your hunger was different than you felt wanton. I seem to remember something like that. A certain virility. At this point, it's incumbent on Calhoun, more comfortable in his queerness and more sexually experienced, to make the first move. Which he does, in a metaphorical sense, in the massacre at the cave. He reveals his true, authentic self, puts his hand down Boyd's pants, and Boyd can't handle it. It's all too much, too soon, way too fast. Boyd's not ready. His fantasies had been all candles and rose petals, and this is a whiskey-soaked tongue down his throat. It's handsy, aggressive. It makes him feel like a piece of meat. So he flees, right off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> Alone in the pit with Reich's rotting corpse, unable to get out due to a broken leg, Boyd struggles with his conflicting desires. He wants Calhoun, in spite of it all, but a lifetime of heteronormative conditioning is a hell of a thing. He struggles to push his desires deep down, but in the end, something's gotta give. With Calhoun's laughter still ringing in his ears, he plunges a bone-handle knife into Reich's leg, groaning as he pumps it back and forth, alone in the dark. Beat that meat, Boyd. When Calhoun reappears as Ives, Boyd is overcome with emotion. His lust for Ives is terrifying and debilitating. In the scene where Slauson asks Ives to remove his shirt to verify Boyd's story, Boyd is caught somewhere between drooling and dysphoria. When the two men are finally alone again for the first time since their encounter in the forest, Ives shocks Boyd by speaking frankly, even flippantly, about this shameful secret that Boyd has been so long hiding and agonizing over. When Boyd makes an appeal to morality, because it's wrong. Ives immediately recognizes it for the self-hating heteronormative conditioning that it is. This queer-coded dialectic, see I told you, of Boyd and Ives is near identical to that of Louis and Lestat from the foundational text of the murder boyfriend's genre, Anne Rice's interview with the vampire. In a pivotal scene where our blood-sucking French Quarter gays have a screaming match over the morality of killing. Lestat said, You do not know your vampire nature. You are like an adult who, looking back on his childhood, realizes that he never appreciated it. You cannot, as a man, go back to your nursery and play with your toys, asking for the love and care to be showered on you again simply because now you know their worth. So it is with you and your mortal nature. Lestat is arguing here that once liberated, a gay can't just go back into the closet. Not really, not in the same way. Expressing your queerness, your true nature, changes you fundamentally. Ives puts it more directly. You know, it's not courage to resist me, Boyd. It's courage to accept me. In response, Louis too makes the appeal to morality. Because it's wrong. Arguing that he can live off the blood of animals, or in our analysis, abstain from sex with men. Lestat replies with a question. Does it bring you happiness, he asked? You wander through the night feeding on rats like a pauper. Does this give happiness? This is insanity, Louis. This is vain. You hunger for it. You just won't resign yourself to it. And what truly lies before you is vampire nature, which is killing. For I guarantee you that if you walk the streets tonight and strike down a woman, you will be filled, Louis, as you were meant to be, with all the life you can hold. It's not so difficult, really. Acquiescence. It's easy, actually. You just give. However, Boyd differs from Louis in that he doesn't just pliantly accept his seducer's advances. While Ives has been busy concocting a seduction, Boyd has been growing into a better version of himself, finally having the courage to embrace his queerness, not on Ives' terms, but on his own. The climactic knife fight between Boyd and Ives, that heated exchange of bodily fluids, is full of homoerotic imagery. 
Sweaty, bearded faces, huffing and puffing. Blades sliding into soft skin. Long, meaningful eye contact. And to top it all off, a deadly post-coital embrace in a bear trap. During his final and fatal sexual encounter with Ives, Boyd goes full power bottom, expressing himself sexually to Ives on his own terms, never losing control of the pace of the encounter. As they lay atop one another, panting and spent, Ives can't help but be impressed, opening pillow talk with, That was really sneaky. Boyd's arc ends with him redeeming himself for his cowardice in Mexico, choosing to die so the curse of the Wendigo is stopped once and for all, or so he thinks. Through the lens of a queer reading, we can see an equally triumphant ending for our tormented protagonist, as he quietly reconciles himself with himself. Ravenous as a story of queer liberation is certainly affirming, but like with Louis and Lestat, it can only really exist in the realm of myth and metaphor. In fiction, lovers dying together is romantic. In reality, it's morbid. Where a queer person may see a highly stylized mythological tale of sexual awakening, a feminist may see a barely exaggerated story of male predation and abuse. Both readings are perfectly valid and can exist independently of one another. I want to make that clear. Tumblr people, please continue writing your dirty gay fanfics without shame. Or maybe just the ordinary amount of shame. Even accounting for the fact that the object of his desire is male, Ives' consumptive sexuality makes him a perfect avatar for heterosexual male aggression. His most traditionally masculine trait is, of course, his carnivorousness. Sexually aggressive men consider women to be pieces of meat, existing for male pleasure only. They are objects, not individuals, and once chewed down to the bone, they are easily discarded. Victims of sexual assault often describe their attack in terms related to animal flesh and flesh-eating, such as the repeated use of the word hamburger to describe the result of violent penetration. The landmark feminist text, The Sexual Politics of Meat, which is somewhere back here, um, ah! Here it is, by Carol J. Adams, explains how meat-eating as an expression of masculine gender roles reflects patriarchal supremacy. The male prerogative to eat meat is an external, observable activity implicitly reflecting a recurring fact. Meat is a symbol of male dominance. It has traditionally been felt that the working man needs meat for strength. A superstition operates in this belief. In eating the muscle of strong animals, we will become strong. According to the mythology of patriarchal culture, meat promotes strength. The attributes of masculinity are achieved through eating these masculine foods. Likewise, in our culture, vegetables are a symbol of female submissiveness. Even the names of those who abstain from meat or animal products, vegetarians, vegans, have feminine connotations. There are an awful lot of V's, A's, G's, I's, N's, and A's in there. That's all I'm going to say. Vegetables, a generic term meat eaters use for all foods that are not meat, have become as associated with women as meat with men, recalling on a subconscious level the days of woman the gatherer. Since women have been made subsidiary in a male-dominated meat-eating world, so has our food. The foods associated with second-class citizens are considered to be second-class protein, the message is clear. The vassal vegetable should content itself with its assigned place and not attempt to dethrone king meat. The fixation toxic men have on the magical properties of meat is indicative of how anxious and unsettled masculine identity can be. Is these people's sense of masculinity so unstable that it has to be continually reaffirmed at every meal? Uh, that certainly seems to be the case with modern-day fascists, whose terror of the soybean has been immortalized in internet culture. I swear, if the RAF struck as much fear into the hearts of fascists in 1940 as a protein-rich East Asian beam does today, the Battle of Britain would have been over in a matter of minutes. While both meat-eating and sexual aggression as male gender performance are usually indicators of deep insecurity, that doesn't make these men any less dangerous. The sequence where Boyd attempts, unsuccessfully, to convince the men around him that Ives is a monster rings uncomfortably true for many women who have attempted to publicly accuse their abusers. And his subsequent hair-trigger vigilance is not too far off from many women's daily lived experiences in the face of male violence. And though he is technically a man himself, I think Boyd's perspective could be regarded as essentially female. Boyd is remarkably feminine by the standards of 19th century America. He clearly doesn't belong anywhere near a battlefield, to the point where one wonders how on earth he landed an officer's commission in the first place. He's gentle, soft-spoken, and sensitive. He abstains from eating meat. Almost every aspect of his personality eschews traditional masculinity. 
So it makes sense that Ives, that shiny, red, throbbing penis of a man, wants so badly to conquer him. And in a feminist reading, it is very much a conquest. Ives doesn't ask people's permission before he eats them, and sexually aggressive men don't consider women's feelings any more than carnists consider the feelings of animals. As Adams puts it, Rape, too, is implemental violence in which the penis is the implement of violation. You are held down by a male body as the fork holds a piece of meat so that the knife may cut into it. In addition, just as the slaughterhouse treats animals and its workers as inert, unthinking, unfeeling objects, so too in rape are women treated as inert objects with no attention paid to their feelings or needs. Consequently, they feel like pieces of meat. Correspondingly, female animals are forcibly impregnated, a reproductive slavery that is required to ensure plentiful supplies of meat and cow's milk. To feel like a piece of meat is to be treated like an inert object when one is, or was, in fact, a living feeling being. Like the carnist, the capitalist, and the colonialist, male abusers' only goals are power and pleasure, and they don't particularly care if that comes at someone else's expense. It's this dichotomy, selfishness versus compassion, that's at the very heart of Ravenous. Good and evil as terms are often vaguely defined, but in practice, these concepts are really quite simple. Evil is a lack of empathy and the aggrandizement of the self. Good is the abundance of empathy and an interconnectedness with others. This is a story of good versus evil, clearly defined and honestly rendered. It's also a story about gay cannibals. It's kind of a movie about everything.